Chemical kinetics is the study of factors that influence reaction rates. An excellent example of kinetics in action is a simple method for catching lizards. Did you know if you pour cold water on a lizard, it'll stop moving? The lizards are ectotherms, meaning their body temperature changes with the temperature of the environment. And the cold water causes the lizard's basal body temperature to fall. And with that fall in temperature, their metabolic rate slows down drastically. The chemical reactions that power the lizard's motion occur much more slowly. As a result, the lizards slow down and can be easily picked up. Once they warm up again, their metabolic rate increases and they move just like they did before. How quickly a reaction can occur and how we can control its rate are important questions in all areas of chemistry. Chemical rates influence energy production, the economic viability of manufacturing processes, treatments for medical conditions and problems, just to name a few. The first step in understanding the basics of kinetics is understanding how we measure chemical reaction rates. So first we want to define how we actually measure rate for a chemical reaction, how quickly it's actually occurring. So we'll consider a simple reaction in which one reactant changes into one product. How do we measure how quickly that change is happening? The easiest way is to measure the change in the concentration or amount of either the product or the reactant. So rates for chemical reactions are generally measured as the changes in concentration over time. And we can more specifically define those as the change in the product concentration over time, if that's what we're measuring, or the change in the reactant concentration over time. Now, if we measure the product concentration, that's going to increase over time since it's being produced. That will give us a positive reaction rate. And the general convention when dealing with reaction rates is that we always have positive values for our rates. If we measure the concentration change of the reactant, on the other hand, it will decrease over time because the reactant is being used up. So this would give us a negative reaction rate. To make sure that we end up with a positive one, the general convention is that we apply negatives to the formulas for rate when we are measuring the changes in concentration of a reactant. And you'll see that as we work through our different problems in this lesson. So let's apply these concepts to a hypothetical reaction of a red molecule turning into a blue one. And here we have a table showing how the amounts of red and blue molecules change for this reaction over a 50 second time interval. At time zero, we start with 100 red molecules and zero blue. So the reaction hasn't started yet, really. And during the first five seconds of the reaction, we form 16 blue molecules. And it is a one-to-one -one relationship in the chemical reaction. So for every, blue molecules that, for every blue molecule that forms, we lose one red molecule. So that means our count for red drops from 100 to 84. Now the reaction continues in the same fashion. And for every five second interval noted here, we form more blue and lose the same amount of red. The rates for this reaction, we can measure using the speed of loss of the red molecules or the speed of gain of the blue molecules. Mathematically, this can be written as follows. The rate equals the negative of the change in the red over the change in time. Or it can be written as the positive of the change in blue over the change in time. 
And we can use these formulas, change in red or change in blue, to calculate the average rate of loss or gain of either molecule for any time interval. So for example, let's calculate the average rates uh, for loss and gain during the first five seconds. So during that time, the red molecule count drops from 100 to 84. We always take a difference for rate as the final concentration or time minus the initial. So that means 84 minus 100 when we're counting the change in our red molecules. And of course that gives us a negative 16. Because we're dealing with a reactant here, red molecules, we are going to apply the negative to give us a positive value overall. We divide this by the time interval, the change in our final time, 5 seconds minus our initial 0. So we end up with 16 divided by 5, which gives us a rate for the loss of red of 3.2 molecules per second. And we can do the same thing for the rate of gain for blue. Again, we'll deal with the first 5 second interval. Um, our change in blue is going to be from 0 to 16. So we'll do 16 as our final minus our initial 0 for the count of blue, divided by the time interval, 5 seconds minus 0 seconds, and we get the same rate of gain, 3.2 molecules per second. So we have the same rate of loss for red and gain for blue because they have a one-to-one -one ratio in the chemical reaction. That's not necessarily the case for every reaction, though. Let's look at another example. Here we have the reaction for the synthesis of hydrogen iodide molecules. So one hydrogen molecule plus one iodine molecule can combine to make two hydrogen iodide. So this introduces a difference in the ratios between our product and any one of our reactants. Let's first calculate the rate of loss or disappearance of hydrogen in the first 10 second interval. So we'll take the final concentration of hydrogen in that interval, 0.819, and subtract from it the initial concentration, which is 1.0. And we'll divide that by our time difference, 10 seconds minus 0 seconds. Since we are dealing with a reactant, we're also going to apply the negative so that we'll end up with a positive rate overall. And this calculation gives us 0.0181 moles per liter per second for the loss rate of hydrogen. Next, let's calculate the gain rate or rate of appearance for hydrogen iodide, our product. So our final concentration for the first 10 seconds is 0.362 minus our initial concentration of 0.0. .0. We'll divide that by our time interval, 10 minus 0 seconds, and we end up with a gain rate for our product of 0.0362 moles per liter. So this is exactly twice the rate of loss for our reactant hydrogen. And this makes sense because for every one molecule of hydrogen that's consumed in the reaction, two molecules of hydrogen iodide are produced. The problem is that now we have two rates for the reaction during that first 10 second interval. For each time interval, in order to characterize that reaction overall, we really should have only one reaction rate, regardless of whether it's defined in terms of reactant or product change. So to account for this, we're gonna define an overall reaction rate that incorporates the coefficients for the reactants and products into our calculation. And this overall reaction rate can be used to characterize the entire reaction over a specific time interval. 
not just the rate of disappearance of one reactant or the rate of appearance of one specific product. It will be one value for the reaction for each specific time interval. So we'll do this by dividing the individual rates of loss for the reactants or rates of gain for the products by their coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. So we'll first define this using a generic reaction to give us a general formula for any reactant or product. In our generic reaction, we have two reactants, A and B, and two products, C and D. The lowercase letters here represent the coefficients, while the uppercase letters represent reactant and product chemical formulas. And our overall reaction rate can be defined in terms of any of the changes of concentrations of these reactants or products. So if we were measuring the change in concentration of reactant A, for example, we would calculate the rate of loss of A over time as the change in the concentration of A over time, we incorporate a negative since we're dealing with a reactant and we want a positive value overall. And then we also divide by the coefficient on A from the chemical formula. So multiplying by one over that coefficient is the same as actually dividing by it. If we do that, we'll end up with the same value we would get if we were measuring the changes in the concentration of reactant B. So for reactant B, if that's what we were measuring, our calculation for that one overall reaction rate for that time interval would be the rate of loss of B, so the negative of the change in concentration of B over the time period, divided by the coefficient on B from the balanced chemical equation. And dividing by that coefficient will also give us the same overall reaction rate that we would get for either of the products if we do the same thing. So if we get, if we measure the uh, changes in concentration of C or D instead, we would calculate the change in concentration of our products over time, and we would divide each of those by their coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. Okay, let's look at this with an actual reaction and actual data. So we'll look at our hydrogen iodide reaction again. And we have data here for the changes in concentration of a reactant hydrogen and a product hydrogen iodide. And we also have some differences in the coefficients, one for the coefficient on hydrogen and two for the coefficient on hydrogen iodide. So we're gonna calculate the overall reaction rate for the different time intervals. And, uh, the formula is going to be slightly different for the hydrogen iodide versus the hydrogen because of those different coefficients. So for our product hydrogen iodide, we're going to calculate the change in concentration of hydrogen iodide over time, and we're going to divide that by our coefficient of two. So that's the same as multiplying by one half as it's written in this formula. For the hydrogen, our coefficient is one. So while it's not really written here because essentially dividing by one or multiplying by one over one, it doesn't change anything, doesn't change the value we'll get. Technically, that is what we are doing when we are calculating that net reaction rate. We're also, of course, going to apply that negative value because this is a reactant. And we always apply that to our reactant concentration changes in order to make them positive. So we've done this. At least we've calculated the rate of loss and the rate of gain for our reactant and product in a previous slide. For um, each of these substances, this is what we get when we now use those values to calculate the net reaction rate for the first 10 seconds. So for hydrogen, the rate of loss of hydrogen is the same as the net reaction rate, the average reaction rate, 
of 0.0181 moles per liter second. The rate of appearance of hydrogen iodide, as we calculated in a previous slide, was twice the value of loss for hydrogen. But when we apply that one half or divide by two, the coefficient again, on hydrogen iodide from the chemical reaction, we end up with the exact same overall reaction rate for that first 10 second interval. And this works regardless of what we're doing, as long as we use the appropriate coefficient from the correct balanced chemical equation for our process. So we can measure any reactant, any product, their changes in concentration over time, and we can use that to calculate an overall reaction rate that is consistent and applies to all of the different terms within that reaction, all the different reactants and products. Now the rate, the overall reaction rate will vary between different time intervals, but it will be consistent within that one time interval if we factor in those coefficients. So here we can apply the same formula to all of the different intervals, all the 10 second intervals that we've collected data for. And you can see that uh, the reaction rate, it actually slows down over time. If we look at the one interval to the next interval, but within each interval, regardless of whether we use the concentration of hydrogen or the concentration of hydrogen iodide, we end up with one consistent reaction rate to characterize that entire reaction for those 10 seconds. So we can use the average rate of reaction calculated in this way to actually determine the rate of disappearance or rate of gain for any reactant or product, even if we didn't measure their concentration cha changes in the lab. So let's look at an example of this type of calculation. The reaction in blue shows the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, in the presence of iodide ion and acid, which is represented by the H+. The products of the decomposition are water and triiodide ion. So we're told that the reactant iodide concentration changes from 1 mole per liter to 0.868 moles per liter in the first 10 seconds of this reaction. So we're only measuring our changes in concentration of one reactant. And we're asked two questions. We're asked for the average rate of the reaction in the first 10 seconds, and then the individual rate of disappearance of just the hydrogen ion over the same time period. So let's separate this calculation into two parts then. And first we're gonna calculate the overall rate of the reaction. And we'll do that using the iodide ion concentrations given. So we're going to define our overall reaction rate as the negative of one third times the change in concentration of iodide ion over time. So this just follows our general formula for uh, calculating reaction rate based upon the stoichiometry, the coefficients of any individual reactant or product. So we know that we're going to use three in the denominator or divide by three because that's the coefficient on iodide and we know that we're going to apply the negative to this because we're dealing with a reactant in the formula. So using our data plugged into this we get negative one-third times 0 0.868 minus one in the numerator divided by 10 seconds or time interval in the denominator and we end up with an overall reaction rate of 4.40 times 10 to the negative third moles per liter per second. And we know that this overall reaction rate is the same value that we would have gotten if we had used some other reactant or product concentrations to calculate it for that first 10 second time interval. So knowing that, if we had measured hydrogen ion disappearance instead of iodide ion and used divided by the coefficient for hydrogen ion, we would have gotten the same value. And we can use that to basically set up our calculation for the rate of disappearance of hydrogen. All right, so our overall reaction rate again. 
the value we got from the iodide ion and dividing by 3 is going to be the same value that we would have gotten if we'd done hydrogen ions instead. The difference in the formula, though, if we'd used the hydrogen ion concentration, we would have divided by 2, which is the coefficient on hydrogen. And of course, we still would have had the negative applied to it because it is a reactant. Okay, so we know the overall reaction rate this time. What we don't know and what we're asked to find is this. This is what we want, the rate of disappearance in hydrogen ion. So we can substitute what we do know into this equation. We can rearrange to solve for what we don't know, and we can get our final answer for the rate of disappearance of the hydrogen ion. So doing the substitution first, um, we would actually get the uh, change in hydrogen over time by itself by multiplying both sides of the equation by 2 to get rid of the fraction 1 half and dividing by negative 1. So that actually gives us negative 2 times the rate. We substitute in the reaction rate that uh, we solved for in the first part of the problem. We get negative 2 times 4.40 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second. And that's equal to negative 8.80 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second. There's one more point we should make about calculating reaction rate from experimental measurements. In the previous examples, we've been calculating the average reaction rate. This is a really simple and easy way to calculate rate based upon changes in concentration over certain intervals. But it should be noted that the larger the time interval we use, the more the average rate might deviate from the true rate of the reaction at any one point in time. And this is because the average rate of a reaction is really a linear approximation of the slope of a curved function. Let's look at this graphically. So here we have the synthesis reaction for hydrogen iodide, this time represented graphically instead of the straight concentration values. So on the x-axis we have time, on the y-axis we have concentration, and each of those individual points that you saw in a data table in previous slides is now plotted on this graph. So the red and yellow lines show the increase in concentration for hydrogen iodide, while the blue line and dots show the decreases in the hydrogen reactant concentration. And the reaction actually slows down over time. This is because as less hydrogen is available to react, the process just moves more slowly and less hydrogen iodide is produced during later time intervals. And as a result, concentration versus time is actually a curved function, not a straight line here. Now the average rate in any given time period represented here is based on the slope of the line connecting the initial and final concentration points for that time period. So if we calculate it from hydrogen, it's the negative of the slope. If we calculate it from the hydrogen iodide concentrations in red, it's one half of the positive slope. So we've already done it for the first 10 second interval. And just showing graphically what we did is we essentially did a straight line approximation between the first two points. And you can see that straight line approximation drawn in here. You can also see that it's fairly close to the curve and our average rate that we calculated for that 10 second interval is actually a pretty good approximation for any point in that 10 seconds. So again, that average rate for the first 10 seconds was 0 0.0181 moles per liter per second. Now let's expand that time interval to 40 seconds instead. So here's the straight line approximation between 0 and 40 seconds, the first 40 seconds. And notice that the straight line approximation deviates from the curve more. So the slope calculated from that straight line approximation 
may not be as great a representative of the rate throughout that entire 40 second period. If we extend the interval to 80 seconds, we get even more deviation from the curve. And again, that average rate that we calculate for those first 80 seconds, in this case 0 0.0108, may not be a great approximation of the rate throughout that entire period. We know that the rate at the beginning portion of the curve is going to be higher, while the rate at the uh, end of the curve, the end portion of that 80 second interval is likely to be even lower than 0 0.0108. An instantaneous rate calculation actually avoids this approximation. It's the calculation of rate at one instant in time, not over an interval. And it's determined by taking the slope of a line tangent to the curve at that one instant in time. For you calculus fans, that's the first derivative of the concentration curve. So we're not going to be doing calculus in this class, but it is useful to look at visually what we mean by an instantaneous rate. So this is the concentration curve for hydrogen peroxide during its decomposition reaction. And this is the balanced chemical equation at the top for that decomposition reaction. So you can see that the concentration of hydrogen peroxide decreases over time. It's a reactant, so that makes sense. And the curve slopes downward. If we wanted to calculate the instantaneous rate at exactly 10 hours, for example, essentially what we would be doing is calculating the slope at exactly that point. And that's equivalent to drawing in a tangent line, a straight line that hits the curve at exactly 10 hours and then calculating the slope of that tangent line. So for example, we would do our rise over our run to calculate slope. So we'd figure out the change in hydrogen peroxide concentration or the change in Y for the tangent line over the change in time in hours as our X, our change in X. That slope would then become the rate of disappearance of hydrogen peroxide, which we could plug into the same general formulas that we used previously to calculate the overall reaction rate. So we would take a negative because it is a, a reactant and we want to flip the negative slope into a positive. And we would also uh, multiply by one half or divide by two since we have a two coefficient on hydrogen peroxide. And that would give us the reaction rate at that one instant in time, at 10 hours exactly. Now for the most part, we're not gonna be using instantaneous rates. We will calculate our rates using intervals uh, known as average rates of reactions, just like we did in the previous examples in this PowerPoint. It's useful though, uh, and it's important to understand the difference between an instantaneous rate and what we'll be calculating, which really is an average rate. To summarize, average rate is the change in measured concentration over time for a specific time interval. As such, it's an approximation of the actual rate at any one point during that time. And the smaller the time interval, the more representative the average rate is of the rate throughout the entire time period. Instantaneous rate is the change in concentration over time for a tangent that's drawn to the concentration curve at one specific point, one specific time, not over an interval. And to represent the overall reaction or excuse me, to represent the overall reaction rate, either method of calculating the rate must divide by the coefficient from the balanced chemical equation for the substance measured. It also incorporates a negative 
if the substance measured is a reactant.